Let us now take a journey down the equine thoracic limb looking at the skeleton. Okay, so we're going to start out looking at the scapula. See the scapula here. Notice up here there's this dorsal region. Usually it cuts off right here. This is a little bit ossified. There's a cartilage portion here, which is the cartilage of the scapula, kind of to extend the length of the scapula and keep it a little bit flexible up there at the withers. We look at the spine of the scapula here. There's a prominent tubercle right here, which you can actually palpate. As you come down to the distal end of the spine, there's no acromium like what we see in the ruminant or in the dog. Okay. So over here is a supraspinous fossa, which is supraspinatus muscle sits and then comes down here to the greater, both greater and lesser tubercle to attach. Yep. Then we have our infraspinatus fossa here. Infraspinatus fossa comes down to attach here on the greater tubercle. In this particular spot right here is going to be our infraspinous bursa. And it's going to attach kind of the tendon will attach here. Some more of the muscle is going to attach right in here. Okay. Now the articulation here on the scapula is the glenoid cavity that articulates with the femoral head. And so this tubercle being above that is the supraglenoid tubercle. Upon this, the biceps brachii muscle will attach, and its tendon is going to come between the tubercles in the intertubercular groove and mold over this intermediate tubercle. Okay. And then if we come around more medially here, we're going to see this little process, which is the corticoid process, on which the... Now if we come on down to the humerus, we see that the greater tubercle has both a cranial and a caudal portion. Likewise, the lesser tubercle is going to have a cranial and a caudal portion. And then we have an intermediate tubercle here in the intertubercular groove. Okay, So upon our supraglenoid tubercle is going to be the biceps brachii muscle and its tendon of origin is going to come across here. And it's going to kind of form over this intermediate tubercle. It's thought that this is going to help when we have the animal just standing and the shoulder wanting to flex. It's going to limit that flexion of that shoulder. Down here then we have the deltoid tuberosity which is very prominent upon which the deltoidus muscle sits. Then in this brachialis groove here is going to be the brachialis muscle is going to come down okay so the biceps brachii muscle is going to come down and attach to this radial tuberosity on the radius distally here now on the humerus we see a very prominent lateral epicondyle and there's also a medial one I'll show you in a minute and then you can see here this fossa upon which when we have flexion of the elbow the radius is going to go into that fossa so that's the radial fossa whereas over here on the caudal side we have a fossa upon which if we extend the elbow the olecranon is going to come up and so that's the olecranon fossa we will actually see the anconeal process go into that. So here now we're going to look at the, the radius and the ulna. Notice very much fusion and reduction of the ulna. This distal part here is actually the lateral styloid process originating from the ulna. But it's now just part of the radius. We have our acromion here. We have our trochlear notch in which the trochlea sits. This portion here is the capitulum which only articulates with the radius. We still have a gap here between the bones or the common interosseous artery to come from the medial side out. Okay. 
and then we come down here to the carpal bones and we'll look at those on a isolated manus. Okay, so looking now at the isolated humerus, on the lateral side we see the greater tubercle with its cranial and caudal portion. We see the deltoid tuberosity. We see the fossa here in which the brachialis muscle sits, so that's the brachial groove. So if we now look at the medial side of this humerus, we can see the head. We can see the lesser tubercle with both a cranial and a caudal portion. We come down here, we have this roughened area, which is the teres major tuberosity, which the teres major and latissimus dorsi attach to. And we come down distally, and we have the medial epicondyle, around here the lateral epicondyle, and in the front, we can see nicely here the condyle with the trochlea, which articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna, and the capitulum, which only articulates with the radius. This depression here is where if we flex the elbow, the radius would go in, so that's the radial fossa. And then over here, once again, if we extend the elbow, the anconial process of the Olecranon comes up into that, and so that's the olecranon fossa. Okay? We look at the isolated ulna and radius. This is a much smaller <laughs> specimen, but we can see here, here's the olecranon tuber, the trochlear notch, the interosseous space there for the common interosseous artery, the pass. We have the radial tuberosity. So here now I've got a portion of the manus, a little bit of the radius and ulna up here. And so distally we can see this is lateral, so this will be the lateral styloid process and the medial styloid process. And starting medially we have these grooves here. This one belongs to the extensor carpi obliquus. It's going to come down to attach to the second metacarpal bone. Then we have coming on down here is going to be the extensor carpi radialis which will attach to the metacarpal tuberosity. And then our common digital extensor will come on down here and come all the way down to our extensor process on the distal phalanx. Okay, so our first row of carpal bones. We're going to start medially with a radial carpal bone. Then we have the intermediate carpal bone and then the ulnar carpal bone. Here we have the accessory carpal bone which is always laterally. Here we have a little groove. That's going to be for the tendon of the ulnaris lateralis muscle coming down to attach on the fourth metacarpal bone. Okay, so then our distal row of bones here. On occasion, we're going to have a first. It's going to be a small bead here, the first carpal bone, but not always. And we see that the second carpal bone is going to sit right on top of the second metacarpal bone. Then we have the third carpal bone, and then the fourth carpal bone. Now, the fourth carpal bone sits both on the third metacarpal as well as the fourth metacarpal. So that's how you can distinguish on a radiograph. So here we have on the caudal surface we can see nicely the second and the fourth metacarpal bone. The medial one is often the longer one because it has more weight pushing on it because it's just this isolated bone pushing down upon it. And we'll also often see that splints, which is a condition where the interosseous ligament here is going to become inflamed and then they're going to fuse to the cannon bone or the third metacarpal bone. Okay. So we come down here now to the digit and we've got the 
distal articular surface of the metacarpus and we can see it's got a sagittal crest right here and this is our metacarpal phalangeal joint our proximal interphalangeal joint and our distal interphalangeal joint okay also commonly known as the fetlock joint the pastern joint and the coffin joint okay so the common names of these bones this is the cannon bone this is the long pastern this is the short pastern so <laughs> makes sense that's the pastern joint and this is the coffin bone which sits in the coffin joint so if we had the hoof on here we would see that the coffin bone and the coffin joint are sitting in it as if it's in a coffin okay so we look at our proximal and our middle phalanx here and we see that there are proximal and distal eminences okay and this kind of roughened area here on the proximal phalanx is where the oblique or middle distal sesamoidian ligament attaches okay so all of our distal sesamoidian ligaments are going to attach on the distal aspect of the proximal sesamoids the straight one comes all the way down here to the second phalanx the middle one sits here in this roughened area and then the cruciates are going to just go like this okay so that's also known as the deep so the superficial is also known as the straight the middle is also known as the oblique and the deep is also known as the cruciate okay down here we have the navicular bone also known as the distal sesamoid that's its proper name we have the flexor surface here where the deep digital flexor tendon comes down and crosses here and there's actually going to be a bursa right there the navicular bursa then that deep digital flexor is going to attach here along the semilunar line and into this flexor fossa and we see these foramina here these foramina are the solar foramina okay into those are going to go the palmar digital arteries okay so the palmar digital arteries go into those there's a terminal arch of it in here and branches from those arteries are going to come through these little foramina here to help supply the hoof okay and we've got once again these are the palmar processes of the coffin bone and the extensor process upon which the common digital extensor attaches i think that's it